trying to dress next gen. Do I look younger than almost 40? I keep trying. I keep trying. Isn't it good to be together? And, uh, you know, Chloni mentioned the, the 5th of November. We've got Helmet coming through. What a testimony, genuinely. Um, I know God's going to do great things in people's hearts on that evening. And so please prioritize coming to that. But not only that, tonight's going to be something special. Um, I think, can we turn that aircon off? Thanks. I can hear it dripping here. Is, um, tonight, because it's Next Gen Sunday, we've got, it's five, possibly six people sharing a five-minute message tonight. Generational. So we've got Pedro. Pedro's not here. He was uh, on stage. Oh, Pedro! Pedro's going to preach a message tonight. My, my daughter's got something to share. We've got someone from youth, someone from adults, young adults. So we've got someone from seniors. And uh, so why don't you come? It's just going to be fun to hear from each of them. Who's got tired eyes? Like, oh, it's so early to come to church because you went to bed at 3 o'clock. Because the Springboks won. <laughs> who's, got a, who's got a proud jersey on this morning? At least you wore white for the UV party, hey? But um, such a celebration, hey? And uh, it's amazing how sport can just bring a nation together and we can celebrate. So, yeah, seniors, we're going to treat you as well. We really love the generations in our church, and that's really what today is all about. I think half of, maybe if you don't have kids, um, many of us are uh, clueless as to what happens next door with Journey Kids. And listen, they have so much fun. Great ministry time, great team that pour into the life of that generation. And so we're going to speak about generations because, listen, it's something that is close to God's heart. And so we're going to pray, give us time to catch our breath and hear from God this morning. Why don't you ask God to bless you this morning, to give you something this morning? I may share something, but maybe it's something else that you need from God. God is not limited. God knows you. God sees you. Ask Him for help. Ask Him for blessing. Ask Him for whatever it is you need. And Lord, we pray too that as we come around your word this morning, as we grasp your heart for the generations, Lord, that something would shift in us, that we would change the way that we think, God, that we would change the way that we act. That we would see how close the children are, adults are, seniors are, to your heart, God. We pray this in your blessed name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. So my message today is keep the fire burning. Can you say that? Keep the fire burning. You know, every fourth year, it's the Olympics. And when the Olympics are launched, there's this unique tradition Maybe you've seen it. I've got a few pictures you can see on screen. Whereas the, the torch relay starts, and, and you've probably seen them holding that torch, running across, and it's fascinating how they do this, and it, I've got some history on it. But it starts weeks before the actual Olympics launch. And the flame is lit, believe it or not, in Olympia, a place in Greece, every single time the Olympics launch. And that torch is then carried to the host country, Many times it's crossed seas and valleys and mountains and uh, something quite unique. That flame is eventually put out only at the closing ceremony of the Olympics. It was formally introduced in 1936 when the flame was transported from Olympia in Greece to Berlin in Germany over, listen, 3,187 kilometers by 3,331 runners in 12 days and 11 nights. There's been this generational practice since 1936. I read for next year, Olympics in Paris, France. They've already got this whole thing planned, and it's going to be lit in Olympia, and it's going to come on a boat across all the way through, and it's going to be the big ceremony with multiple runners doing it. But the flame symbolizes a few things, namely positive values and unity of humanity. I had a good laugh doing my research in 1956 in Melbourne, Australia. There was a group of veterinary students who kind of wanted to protest against this whole idea of the Olympics because they said it was rooted in some Nazi practices and they didn't quite like it. So 
So these guys got together, some naughty university boys, and they said, we're going to make a mockery of this. And so they created their own torch. They used a wooden leg from a chair. They found some silver bucket. They stuck it on the top. They found a pair of underwear, dipped it in paraffin, put it in their little homemade bucket, and somewhere near the, the, the end line going into the closing opening of the ceremony, they just kind of snuck in, and they just sent one of the runners in. And he was running with his table leg chair, his pot, and his underwear on fire. And he ran right up to the Lord Mayor of Sydney, handed him the torch for the official ceremony, and disappeared into the crowd. And everyone's thinking, hmm, but it's too early. How is this happening? We're not on schedule. And everyone's baffled. And they think, who was that man? And listen, he just made a mockery of this thing. And eventually the runner came in and it was quite a thing, but I had a good laugh. But it's so special how this tradition has been passed down from generation to generation. From 1936, I'm not sure if a year or two were missed because of wars or what was going on. But you know, we find something similar in the scriptures. God in the wilderness wanted to meet with his people. He said that they've got to build a tabernacle. Eventually later they, we know that they built the temple. But it was a place where God could be with his people. And he said, there's, there's a way that things are going to work in the tabernacle. And the priests are then prepared for duty. And this is what we find God saying to Moses to instruct the priests to do. Leviticus chapter 6. Who read Leviticus this week? Who's read Leviticus in their life? You should. It says, the Lord said to Moses, give Aaron and his sons this command. These are the regulations for the burnt offering. Now, the burnt offering was one of the sacrifices that the nation had to bring before God, and it was to atone or cover for their sin. And it was multiple times, morning and evening, there had to be a sacrifice. I think at new moon or new month, there was different times. But it says, the burnt offering is to remain on the altar hearth throughout the night till morning, and the fire must be kept burning on the altar. The fire on the altar must be kept burning burning. It must not go out. Every morning the priest is to add firewood and arrange the burnt offering on the fire and burn the fat of the fellowship offerings on it. The fire must be kept burning on the altar continuously. God says it must not go out. Can you see how God is so strict on this that the fire must not go out. Twice the fire must keep burning it must not go out. You see, the priests had an ongoing responsibility to keep the fire burning. The fire represented not only God's presence, but also God's power to the people. One of the commentaries I read, the Barnes note on the Bible, said that this was a symbol of the never-ceasing worship which Yahweh required of His people. A never-ceasing, never-ending worship. How many of us worship God on a Sunday and then come back in seven days to worship him again. Never ceasing, day and night, the fire must be kept burning. It must not go out. And I want to remind us, Journey Church, that, that you and I have the ongoing responsibility, the same as those priests do, not to keep an altar burning, but to keep the fire of God alive throughout the generations. From Journey Kids to Journey Youth to Journey Young Adults to Adults, through to the seniors, not to step back and say, well, it's fine if I enjoy church and it's my church and I just enjoy it and not think generationally because God himself is very, very generational. And so to, to be a church that's generational requires great effort, lots of commitment and intentionality so that we can pass the baton on to the next generation. And I hope that what I shared today will do this justice and I must give credit to Pastor Bayless Conley, a mentor of mine. I just listened to a sermon on his on generational thinking, and I've stolen one or two thoughts from him. But one of the, the famous names given to God, we know, is the God of Abraham. Why? He could have just been the God of Abraham and stopped there. I'm Abraham's God. I'll give the promise to him. And why must we mention? No, because God is thinking ahead. God is always thinking generation. And I'll give you this challenge. Go read your Bible this week and see how much God thinks this way. We're going to look at some scripture today. Deuteronomy 6 being the first one. It says, these commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Maybe you've made bread before and you've rolled the dough and you 
just want to put your fingerprint or your handprint in there and it's, you impress it on the dough. God says, impress my commandments on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. What's God saying? Always. He's not really being specific. All right, wake up, let's talk. Go to bed, let's talk. No, he's saying it's, you never stop. The fire must keep burning. You never stop teaching the next generation, learning from past generations. Tie them as a symbol on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Now, Jewish people literally, did, it was a command God gave them. My parents actually own and live in a townhouse that was owned by a Jewish family previously. Guess what you find at the front door? Nailed to the doorpost. The Ten Commandments. Why? So that when you come in and when you go out, you are reminded of the commands of God. This is how serious the nation took what God said. Psalm 22 says this. Before I read that, keeping the fire burning. Impress the stuff on your children. I recently spoke to a Muslim lady in the area. They make some of the best samosas ever. God bless them. And I was talking to her, and while we're waiting for my order, um, we were talking about schools and where the kids are and where do you live and how far must you travel to get your kids. Anyway, we're speaking, and then she says, oh, no, the only place we have to drive out to is Arkin Park every day because our kids must go to Madresa, which is Arabic for place of learning, either religious or non-religious. And they take their kids for, many people say, a minimum of one hour a day for five days a week to go study the Quran. Committed. My children will go and learn the Quran. How many of us as parents, Christian parents, who know freedom, forgiveness, Jesus Christ, sometimes speak about the scriptures, sometimes sit with our kids in school and say, no, 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 this is what the Lord says. This is what our God said. This is who Jesus is. This is who the Holy Spirit is. This is what God expects from you. No, we don't do it this way. We do it this way. Now, many of us leave discipleship for chance. And we think, no, the church will do it. I'll, I'll say more about that. No, no. They are so committed to keeping their fire burning. We've got to keep our fire burning. Psalm 22 says this, Our children will also serve Him. They made this promise, this declaration. Our children will serve God. Future generations will hear about the wonders of the Lord. His righteous acts will be told. They're committed. They will be told to those not yet born. I want us to, in our mind's eye, think of those not yet born that will join Journey Church. What are we going to leave for the next generation. I often entertain this thought. What if I were to pass on in 20, 30 years and my children are here, whether they're involved in ministry or not in some way, and the other generations that come in, what are we going to, not what am I, what are we going to hand over to that generation? They will hear about everything he has done. What's God saying? Keep the fire burning. They will hear, they will be told everything about God. Again, the God of generational thinking. The day of Pentecost, the Spirit comes and they, they re reference a scripture from the prophet Joel. And what does it say? It says, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my Spirit on all people. Now listen to the generations. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. What's God thinking? All of you, generational. Not just the old men. Not just the guys in the synagogue, the religious people. No. Every generation needs to know the Spirit of God. Church, we've got to keep the fire burning because God is a God of generations. And a, and a church is healthy. A church is headed for a successful future, if I could say that, if it represents all generations. You and I know of churches, even in this town, where there was a neglect for the next generation. And what's happened? The church is next to closing its doors. Why? Because... Certain generations thought, we like church, it's just about us, and we're not going to accommodate the next generation. And now they're wondering, what's the succession plan? There isn't one, because you weren't intentional. And that's why as a church, we are continuously burdened to think, what do we do for journey kids? They are not there babysitted while the big parents do church. No, those kids are being discipled. They have full-on church, just as we have here. They have next door for different age groups. The old need the young, and the young need the old. Amen. And you know, no generation's better or more in the right than the other. We learn from each other because every generation has something that the other doesn't. We learned this morning that some of us, we've lost our passion and our energy. 
I can't do that. Am I supposed to? Can I? Yes. They can carry that energy. All of us can in our praise and our worship to God. A generation may have wisdom. Scriptures speak about do not remove an, do not move an old boundary marker, it says in the Proverbs. So, so if, if the wise can tell us that for centuries this is how it's been done, this works. Young generation, don't think you should go and shift it because it's not going to work. Just let it be. That's how it works. Some generations have experience. How do we do this? So thankful for the ministers in my life, almost double my age, that I can go to and say, how do I do this? You've been there. I haven't. School me for the sake of this generation and the next. Some generations have relevancy. Some of us are stuck in 1970, 1980 and say, I want to sing those songs in church. No. Why? Because times change. And certain age groups, generations have a, a cultural relevance. Is it wrong? No. Paul said, I became all things to all men. If we're a church in 2023 and we look like we're in 1981, we've missed something. There's a cultural relevance. Are we becoming like the world? No. It's all always about Jesus. Can I say this to the young generation? You know, when it comes to church, future building, all that's going on, you know what the seniors have that you don't have? Young children, next, young generation. You know what they have? They've got the money. They've got the money. So best respect the elders. But you know, scriptures are filled with success stories of those who kept the fire burning. But there's also some tragic ones. Some of the best ones have got to be the handover. That handing over the baton between Elijah and Elisha. Elisha's heart, he said, he wants a double portion of Elijah's spirit on him. There was this heart, this desire in him, this younger man, who would succeed this great prophet. He said, I want double of what you've got. Do we live with that? Like those who have gone ahead of us. Like we honor you, thank you, and I want to be double of what you were. Moses, Joshua. Moses was one of God's greats, but Joshua succeeded him and took the nation into the promised land in Canaan and took out those 30 or 31 kings. And then one of the best we'll look at now now is David handing the kingdom over to his son Solomon. But here's a failed attempt that we read about in Judges chapter 2, verse 6 to 11. After Joshua had dismissed the Israelites, they went to take possession of the land, each to their own inheritance. The people served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and of the elders who outlived him and who had seen all the great things the Lord had done for Israel. Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. And they buried him in the land of his inheritance at Timnath, Heres, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gosh. After that whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. The children of Joshua's generation saw the great things. God took you out of them into the promised land. We would expect that it would just be that they would serve the Lord, the next generation. But they grew up not knowing the Lord. And it says, then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals. Tragic. They turned to the false gods. But your dad was Joshua. Your aunt was this one. Your grandfather was this one. How is it? See, because we think it's, it's just going to happen. No, it requires great intentionality. Those priests at the burnt offering every morning, every evening, every morning put wood, every evening put wood. We've got to be concerned about the next generations, past, present, and future. As a church, we need to decide, how's our story going to end? How is our story, hopefully it doesn't end, that our church continues till Christ comes again, eh? That would be the best. But let's look at David and Solomon's handing over of that torch. It said, King David rose to his feet and said, Listen to me, my fellow Israelites, my people. I had it in my heart to build a house as a place of rest for the ark of the covenant of the Lord, for the footstool of our God. And I made plans to build it. Now listen, but God said to me, you are not to build a house for my name because you are a warrior and have shed blood. Imagine doing all those plans. Some of you have done house building or business building and you had all these plans. Imagine getting there. You've had the conversation with the architect, the, the quantity surveyor, the everyone involved. 
And then you're told, no, but you can't build. Like you would be distraught. You're like, no, but it's, here's the plans. Let, let's go. Let's go. We, we've got everything. We've got all the money. We've got everything we need. It's in place. Let's go. And God says, no to David. Now, how do you think David would feel? Was he offended? Did he sit back and, oh, fine, just take it. Who cares? You know how much effort, how much money I put into that? Now, now listen to David's heart. And we've got to catch David's heart. He says, of all my sons, and the Lord has given me many, he has chosen my son Solomon to sit on the throne of the kingdom of the Lord over Israel. He said to me, Solomon, your son is the one who will build my house and, uh, and my courts. For I have chosen him to be my son, and I will be his father. Then David gave his son Solomon the plans for the portico of the temple, its buildings, its storerooms, its upper parts, its inner rooms, and the place of atonement. Can you hear the detail? that David had put together with the help of the Spirit. He gave him the plans of all that the Spirit had put in his mind for the courts of the temple of the Lord and all the surrounding rooms, for the treasuries of the temple of God and for the treasuries for the dedicated things. He gave him instructions for the divisions of the priests and Levites and for all the work of serving in the temple of the Lord, as well as for all the articles to be used in its service, plan after plan, yet you can't do it. David also said to Solomon, his son, be strong and courageous and do the work. See, what's, what's happening there? Generational. doesn't just hand a bat and say, good luck, son. Off you go. I'm just going to be sitting up here eating grapes all day, getting fanned with palm leaves. No, he stands next to his son and he cheers him on. What does he say? Come on. Be strong and courageous and do the work. Do not be afraid. See, seniors, we, we need you to tell us that. Yes, we serve the same God, but we need the, those words to come out of your mouth. Come on, young generation, you can do it. As he was with me, he will be with you. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord God, my God, is with you. He will not fail you or forsake you until all the work for the service of the temple of the Lord is finished. Now, for the most part, Solomon did pretty good. Wisest man that's ever walked, wealthiest man that's ever walked this planet as well. Yet his life ended tragically because he, he took on wives that he shouldn't have, and they turned his heart, and he also worshipped false gods. We're not going to look at that. That's tragic, but we're going to look at David's heart because David got it right. David handed over that torch with great care. And he said, it's not about me. Maybe some of us need to get to that point in our faith. It's not about me. Yes, God loves, God cares, but God doesn't stop with you. God always thinks generationally. Paul said that we've got to run our race. We've read that. Run your race, go for gold. Preached a message on that not long ago. But we can become so selfish, so individualistic about this, where Paul said, no, I must run my race. It's just about me and Jesus and my church and my experience and what's happening with me. But maybe we should entertain the thought, just switch over, that maybe that race is not an individualistic race, it's a relay race. That if you watch a relay, what happens? One runner starts holding a baton, runs a certain distance, and then the next runner starts running alongside. There's always a transition and a handover. It's never quickly. And they run together, and eventually at the right time, the next generation, or the next runner will go and run their leg and then pass it on to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next, until they win. We've got to see our Christian race the same. It's not just me, Jesus, in heaven. No, no, it's who's around me, who's younger, who's older. How are we running? Why? Because this is the way that God thinks. And maybe some of you sitting in the room thinking, yeah, I hope those people are listening because God's surely not speaking to me about this. That's the problem. We always think someone else is going to do it, don't we? We say, no, 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 no there's, there's, surely there's younger people. It's people with the energy, people with the money. You don't know. I'm just going to sit here. Do you know that everything that God needs to build the future is sitting right before me? But the future of Journey Church is not what you're looking at. It's what I'm looking at. God gives the fivefold ministry. Why? Apostles, prophets, teachers, evangelists, etc. Why? To equip the saints for works of service. Our model is that no, the pastor's going to do it. The church rests on his shoulders and God says, no, he plays one role. He might guide, lead, and direct. But it's the church's responsibility to carry the flame. See, you're a torch carrier. You are the fire keeper. <laughs> You are the future of our church. Don't think someone else. No, God's looking at you saying, 
Surprise, surprise. Yes, it's you. Do you feel unqualified? Yes. Do you feel disqualified? Sometimes. Are you available? Hopefully. Are you gifted? Yes. You know, I would say that there are some of you sitting in this room, your heart burns for a next generation, either the seniors, maybe for adults, maybe for kids. Can I encourage you to step into it? Just trust God with it and see where he leads you. But you are the future of this church. Ephesians 2 verse 19 to 22 in the message translation says this. You're no longer wandering exiles. It speaks about our salvation and how Jesus has taken us in. And it says this kingdom of faith is now your home country. You're no longer strangers or outsiders. You belong here with as much right to the name Christian as anyone. God is building a home. He's using us all irrespective of how we got here in what he is building. He used the apostles and the prophets for the foundation. Now he's using you. Say me. He's using you. Fitting you in brick by brick, stone by stone, with Christ Jesus as the cornerstone that holds all the parts together. We see it taking shape day after day. God's church always grows. A holy temple built by God. All of us built into it. A temple in which is God is quite at home. See, bricks speak about ongoing, generational. It's not just one brick in the wall. There's multiple bricks that will build a building. And I don't know if you know this, but God never builds by accident. God never leaves anything to chance. Like, wow, I didn't see that one coming in my church. No, he builds his church. He leaves nothing to chance. Don't ever think that you, you are sitting here by chance. But of all the places in the world at any generation, God has placed you here now to hear these words. When it comes to impressing things on our, our children, I want to say this, that so many of us are so concerned with the government and schools and religious education, and some of us get in a twist about this, that, they, that they've pulled prayer out of schools. The morals, the ethics, the prayer is gone. It's a doomed nation. Can I challenge you to say that it was never the government's and never the school's responsibility to disciple the next generation? I don't care if they pray in a school or not, because it's not. It would be great if they do. But God's model is that parents disciple their children. Second to that, the church helps parents disciple their children. We don't throw our children to the church and say, you do it. But God says, you're the parent. You impress these things on your children. The church will only contribute to what you are already doing at home. Someone said, you know, if we don't win them to Jesus, we're going to lose them to the world. There's no middle ground. If we don't win that next generation, we will lose them to the world. We've got to teach them the truth. This is what God says. This is what we stick to. We don't bend the truth. We hold to the truth. We remind them of God's faithfulness. Oh, you know what God did for me 20 years ago? I've got to tell you, son. And you can trust him as well. We've got to help them discern the voice of God. Young Samuel's brought into the, the temple with Eli. Eli's sleeping. He hears the voice of God. And he goes to Eli and says, hey, hey. You called me. Eli says, no. It happens three times. And eventually, Eli the prophet says, it's God speaking to you. He didn't know how to discern God's voice. And a young generation may hear God, but can't make sense of it. And, and, and the next gen, the previous gen, come in and say, hey, this is what God is saying to you. We've got to show what it is to be generous, extend love, model obedience. We know that kids don't do what we say. Kids do what we do. Parents, maybe you smoke. You say, kids, don't smoke. Guess what they're going to do? It happened in my family. Mom and dad said, don't smoke. But, but, but you do. So I do what you do. I don't do what you say. No different in the church. What is mom doing? What's dad doing? Well, parents, don't be disappointed. Why? Because we're modeling. This is what it looks like to be a Christ follower. I'm going to do my best to hand this over generation. I'm going to be responsible in keeping the fire burning. And I want to give credit to all our next-gen teachers quickly this morning. So if you're one of the next-gen teachers, volunteers in service, we just want to acknowledge you quick. And so you can stand to your feet. I'm not sure if all of them are here. Some of them, few of you. There were so many in the 8 a.m. service. Listen, these are just a few who are involved in next-gen services. And I want you to give them a massive round of applause. Thank you, guys. From journey kids to explorers to catalyst in high school youth. 
thank you for, for your efforts. And you know, I said to the team this week, I said, I want to get an exact amount of names and ages of everyone who is involved in next-gen ministries in our church. I want to figure because numbers tell a tale. And so I sat and I worked it out today with all the volunteers that we have that serve kids and youth um, who are not adults yet, under 18. We figured out that the average teacher age in our church is 24 years old. What does that say? How do we interpret that? That, that it's left mainly to a 24-year-old to disciple the next generation. Is it wrong? No ways. These guys are doing a great job, the best they can. But what if we added a bit more of another generation to that mix? What could happen? What wisdom could be passed on? Because one generation doesn't have what another has. And let's be honest, there was things at 21, 24 that I didn't know. Never mind life, but faith. But as I've journeyed with Jesus for 18 years, I've learned lots that I can go and sit with them and say, hey, this is how we can disciple the youth. This is how we can do better with kids because I've, I've got experience to, to pass down. So we appreciate the efforts of this team that you guys are legends. But I do believe that God is calling some of us to step up, to stop saying, oh, someone else will do it. No, no, no. God is calling you. You know that the church has always benefited from previous generations. You would not be sitting here today if it wasn't for a generation. People you don't even know, people who are not in this church, people who are long gone, some of them have passed away, funded the launch of this church. Now we should sit back and say, thank you. That there was a generous generation that said, not only will we fund it, but we will give our lives and sacrifice and service to see the Frenachan city reached for Jesus. It wasn't left to chance. It was great intentionality. I was part of the church planting back then. Why? Generational. It's not just us. It's not just happy church. It's what's going to follow. Let's hand over the baton. Jesus speaks to his disciples as I close. John 4. Jesus said, I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work. That's what ministry is. That's what the kingdom of God is for us. It's great blessing, but it's hard work. Yes, you've got to come early. Yes, you will leave late. Yes, you will be tired. No surprise. That's what serving is. Others have done the hard work, and you have reaped the benefits of whose labor? Theirs. So if they modeled it to us, we're going to say, well, we're going to model it to them, and them, to them, and them, to them, and them, to them. The fire must be kept burning. It must not go out. We've often said this, that an inheritance is what we leave for someone. It could be a car, houses, money. We leave something for them. A legacy is what we leave in you. This is what it's like to follow Jesus, to love him wholeheartedly. I believe God's asking us to look back. Thank you, God, for that generation. Thank you for their labor, their hard work, all that they've contributed. We honor them. Give honor where honor is you. Young people, we never just write the seniors off. We thank them because if it were not for them, we wouldn't be here today. And then he's saying, let's look ahead. There's the next generation. What are we going to do? God leaves nothing to chance. God builds through you and I. Amen. 